done, dude. I'm only introducing this. I know, it's like just leave already. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Schedule. So uh, this next this next thing is um, uh, it's one of the things that Net does, and one of our kind of uh, um, core principles, core goals, uh, part of our core mission is advocacy, and that's uh, that's very big. Uh, a big part of it is has, has been explaining ensembles, uh, just really advocating for the ensembles as a field, as this community. And there's a second part of the ensemble, which is being part of a national conversation of advocacy for the arts, advocacy for all those issues we care about, from uh, fair, equitable wages to NEA support, right? Like uh, our, our interests in advocacy span a great deal of topics. And so, uh, so one thing that NET has done in the last couple of years, and you may or may not be aware of, and so we wanted to take this moment to just make sure we can build in some, of, some, uh, some conversation around it, is our advocacy efforts. We are members of the Performing Arts Alliance. Yeah. The Performing Arts Alliance is comprised of uh, arts organizations, networks, service organizations across the performing arts who come together and collectively uh, build strength and community around pressing advocacy issues. Uh, and here at my side is Christine Davis. <laughs> Is the general manager, is that right? Mm -hmm. The general manager for the Performing Arts Alliance. And so we're here to, uh, to talk about some of this work. But before, but before I do that, um, I just want to give a, a quick, just really short uh, mention of why it was important for NET to join the PAA. Uh, and, um, and, and like I said, we've been, we've been members now for about a year and a half. And, uh, and a big part of it was wanting to have our voice, the voice of this community, of the way that we create, of the way that we organize, of the values that we carry with us as these collectives, to bring that perspective to national conversations around advocacy, uh, to be with our peers uh, uh, who are working on similar things, to build those relationships, to find those moments of, of uh, overlap where we share similar concerns, similar, similar values, and the realities of day-to-day -day life just keep us from picking up the phone and connecting around them. This is a built-in opportunity where we can come together and just hear from one another what we're working on, what the issues are, what, uh, what opportunities are for collaboration uh, and for moving things forward. And so uh, in this short time that we've been, that we've been involved, it's been, it's been really amazing. I, I gotta say, it's one of the, it's one of, I, I feel, one of the most important things that NET is doing right now is, is just being at that table and having that voice and, and making these connections, building these relationships with our peers. And so, um, so, that, so that, that, that's what led us there and I think what's gonna keep us there. Uh, and so, so to share out some of this information and to hear from you all to inform the advocacy work of the PAA, uh, we've invited Christine to come here and uh, talk with us and lead us through this conversation. So uh, I'll uh, hand it over to you. How's everybody doing? Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Post lunch, post swim, 
we're still hanging in there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have a question. Before, three minutes ago, who had ever heard of the Performing Arts Alliance? That makes me happy. <laughs> what did you hear? What did you know? It was in our packet. <laughs> <laughs>
about these federal issues. Could be a lot, could be not at all. But what do they matter to you in your daily work? How does the NEA funding trickle down to what you do every day? How does um, a possible change in a charitable giving uh, policy affect your donors and your work that you do? And also, what else? What else should a national organization that, re that uh, represents uh, the performing arts field be aware of that it should be paying more attention to in its advocacy efforts? So that's what we want to talk about today. So that's a lot. Any questions before there's more? Thoughts? Head nods? Awesome. Can I ask a quick question for y'all? Yeah. How many here um, self-identify as unaffiliated independent artists? Great. How many here identify as members of an organization? Cool. To, to piggyback on that, organization people, are you organizations of artists or organizations of administrators? Let's see, organizations of artists? And organizations of arts administrators. Both. And we have a third category of cultural workers. Yeah. Cultural workers. Different versions of the law 
that are looking at um, sort of the effects of the standardized testing and the stripping down of the school day and um, all of the uh, standards and the scores and how that's affecting teachers' jobs. And what our concern for the arts education aspect of that is there's very specific language in the legislation that outlines what is considered a poor academic subject. There's literally one sentence with a bunch of different um, topics listed in it, uh, <coughs> mathematics and reading and social sciences and et cetera. And uh, our particular coalition was very clear about the arts needing to be stated and listed out in this sentence because if you're labeled as a poor academic subject, it opens up um, a variety of areas for federal funding for programming in schools. So that literal listing in legislation is something that we, we worked on in coalition. Um, Glad to say that when we saw the Senate's version of the, um, their version of the No Child Left Behind uh, rewrite, the new law, that particular sentence about for academic subjects did contain arts. So that in that particular version of the law, it would allow for arts education to be eligible for a um, variety of spending. So for example, Title I funding, um, schools that receive Title I funding can use it to, um, to support their arts education programs. Um, what is Title I funding? Title I funding is for, <laughs> oops, definition time. So Title I funding is for <laughs> students um, for dis, I, I don't like the term, um, disadvantaged. I don't like that term, but if you understand what I'm trying to say. Underserved. Yeah, underserved uh, for populations of underserved students. So it's a particular funding stream that allows for um, programming or um, don't like the term intervention, that's the term, that's the language that gets used, but that's what that pot of money is for. Um, and uh, so with, <coughs> see a hand. Uh, it's for Title I schools. Yeah, for schools. Correct. Right, it's for schools, so for, but the, yeah, for school districts, and it's based on who is in the, student, the school's population, or whether or not they get that designation. So, yeah, you're welcome. Stop me if there's jargon. Please do, because there's a lot of it. Um, so, for example, I said that in the Senate's version of the bill, there was that particular language about arts education. Um, Senate creates its version of the legislation, the House creates its version, and they have to come together. Um, their Senate and uh, Congress is at recess right now, and when they come back, I believe it's next week, we'll see a lot more action of what happens with different versions of each bill. So that's a to be continued story, but we like what we saw coming out of the Senate's version and we hope to see that in the final bill. Um, another issue on the platform, um, so a pretty hot topic right now is the protection of performing arts wireless technology, also known as white space. We talked about this um, at the, the session we did at Alternate Roots and also at um, a session we did in Austin. Um, does anybody have any idea what that means, white space? When you hear the term, a couple people. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you remember mid to late 2000s when uh, TV was going digital and you had to get your digital converter box, digital box was going to work? Um, the broadcast airwaves that TV was on before it went digital became um, vacant and television stations still own them. But um, in the 2012 Jobs Act, Congress mandated that the FCC auction off those airwaves, those um, broadcast channels for um, new broadband technology that would need that spectrum, access to that, those airwaves to function. So new mobile devices, new things that have not been created yet, but there will be a market for. So operating on those television broadcast stations were wireless microphones that are used in the performing arts. And as the auction begins, I believe it's gonna begin next spring, there is a um, chance of wherever these, uh, whatever band of spectrum, that the microphones end up in being replaced to, there could be a lot of interference from either these new and coming devices that are going to be used or other microphones. So the issue becomes, as the spectrum gets rearranged for other devices that are going to be coming to market at some point, how is the quality of wireless devices used in performing arts technology going to be compromised? So that is what the issue is here. That's a very brief summary in about three sentences. There's a little bit more information at one of the stations um, but that's a quick overview of that matter. Also, international cultural exchange. I was talking to some folks here from Bond Street. Bond Street in the house. Woo -hoo. We got a little shout out to Bond Street and some of our materials. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> so international cultural exchange operates out of the State Department, um, Bureau of Cultural Affairs. And 
we advocate for the appropriations of that program. Um, we actually just joined an alliance that advocates in general for cultural exchanges, um, educational. So together we hope to bring a little bit more awareness to um, the benefits of, of international artistic cultural exchange. And um, we are advocating for that issue. I think that's all I can. That's all no, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Um, the visa process for foreign guest artists. Ooh, I heard an oof. <laughs> we know what that is. The amount of time that it takes for visa processing to go through. <laughs> the, um, the issue at stake here is what is called the arts provision. The arts require timely service. And it is a, um, an ask to Congress that if for some reason an organization's petition gets delayed, not for any fault of their own, through some sort of processing through USCIS, that an organization not have to be charged that premium processing fee if it comes down to it not being their fault that the delay happened. Um, that particular piece of legislation, um, do you remember in June of 2013 when there was immigration reform passed in the Senate? That piece of legislation was included in that bill. But if you also remember the conversation about that, the House said that that legislation was dead on arrival. And we have yet to, as Congress, pick up comprehensive uh, immigration reform. So that is um, a piece of legislation that we're hoping might, get, um, might come back to surface as that conversation continues, as what can we do to improve that visa processing um, situation. And also net neutrality. Any people following net neutrality? Right, so the issue here at stake was can internet service providers um, do anything to harm or slow down or block legal content um, that is posted to um, various sites, YouTube, um, Vimeo, any place that people have the access to have that freedom of speech, to express themselves, to reach new audiences, to promote their own work. The internet should be that free platform where they're able to do so. So in this particular case, um, in February, the FCC came out with a new set of regulations about, um, about net neutrality. Uh, last January, their old rules got kicked out. They were basically told by DC Circuit Court that they didn't have the authority to enforce them the way, the way that they were laid out. Um, the FCC had been, had been, over the last year, having um, a lot of open comments um, periods with the public about saying, what do you think is the best way to enforce rules of the internet? And they used an authority in the Communications Act um, that basically allows them to regulate the internet with the same authority that allows them to uh, regulate telephone services. <coughs> and considering that the internet, sort of internet as it is used now is much more of a utility than um, anything separate from that, the way that people are using it um, <coughs> on a daily basis. So in February, the FCC came out with its latest set of rules that categorizes internet activity as the same way that we would categorize telephone services. And they felt that that was the strongest legal authority to create rules that would prevent internet service providers from being able to block lawful content or slow it down. Those rules went into effect in June, mid-June. However, as um, appropriations in Congress were playing out, both the House and the Senate put some riders into their bills trying to prevent those rules from going into effect. Um, a lot of the arguments are saying that it wasn't broken, so there were no rules needed to fix it. Um, and a lot of, some of the arguments are that, well, if Congress creates laws to regulate the internet, then they won't change every time there's a new FCC commissioner. So as it is right now, the rules did go into effect in June. Um, the final legislation, that, that particular, those, particular, um, those particular writers coming in from Senate and from the House were in the bill that funds, it's called the General Services Bill. And until Congress comes back from recess, we won't know what the final version of that bill says, but both sides have something in it that should try to prevent those rules from going into effect. That was a really, really quick overview of a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Lots of questions. Yeah, you, you skipped trouble getting Did I skip trouble getting yeah, Was yeah, it at the yeah, bottom of my page? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. It was. I had my thumb, yeah. my thumb over it. Mm. <laughs> okay. Charitable giving, tax reform, tax policy. We look at two different aspects of charitable giving, one being the general charitable deduction and the other being the IRA charitable rollover, which allows donors, I believe it's 70 and a half, to give um, up to $100,000 um, a portion of their IRA to their charitable, to their charity of choice without tax. So it's an incentive 
for donors of that age and of that uh, means. And we also look at just the general charitable giving, um, not that specific category. Um, in the tax reform conversation, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not charitable giving ought to be capped. Um, the number that gets tossed out is 28%, cap all charitable deductions at 28%. And research about that particular percent has said that, well, it's going to cut out a lot of people who would give. And the argument from the arts community is, again, well, it's not really broken. Um, you don't want to do anything that would discourage somebody who can give of their own discretionary income to give. And that lets people choosing to support um, the charities or the arts organization that they feel you know, are doing good work. And they want to be a part of supporting that. Um, with the IRA rollover, it keeps expiring at the end of every tax year. And the argument there is a lot of organizations have donors that that is the way they give and that's the way they commit their giving. And organizations plan on that. But if this particular provision keeps expiring and expiring and donors don't know that they have it the next year, uh, development departments don't know that they have it the next year, it makes it really difficult to plan your programming and your giving. So the argument there is to just make it a permanent tax revision so that people can rely on it and it's always there and it's a resource that we know we can count on for our work. Any questions? So when you said the, the charitable deductions count at 28%, that's 28, what is that 28%? 28 percent of income. Okay. Yeah. So when you itemize and then, okay. Any other questions? I know that was a lot of stuff. So, um, what we, I would like to do next is get into the conversation of what do you care about these kind of issues? How do they matter to your work? Do they matter the way that I've just described them, the way that we talk about them? And if not, how should we be talking about them? Because what's important is that the way we represent the issues on the Hill is reflective of the way that they play out in the field. So I've set up some stations. We've got a couple of stations around the room. Can I just ask a question? Go ahead. Going to that. Can you say like three victories, three successes that the organization has pulled off in the last like 10 years? In the last 10 years? 10 years, whatever, five years. Yeah. I've been here for two. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that I can give you 10. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, one that I, well, I can give you one that's a little bit um, ahead of my time. So I talked about um, the, our platform for arts education and how there's two wise funding for the arts in the Department of Education and also funding. Uh, or also the placement of arts education and elementary and secondary education act. Um, I want to say this fiscal year 2011, um, a lot of different subject areas got their funding cut from the Department of Education's allocation. Um, there were different subjects like math and science and reading and arts and et cetera. Each had sort of their own um, grant program, their own sort of individual funding stream, and all of them got cut. The arts were at 40 million as their own program. Arts advocates rallied and stood up and wrote Congress and went to meetings and, and the, the base really rallied. And when the final budget was set, arts education was the only program that came back with its own independent funding stream. It came back at 25 million, but it was the only one that came back. So I say that that's a victory of the field of, of like I said, we work a lot in coalition of um, the organizations sort of getting grassroots aware of this is what's going on and this is what's going to affect it. And arts advocates really rising up to, um, to take action. That was a, a big deal. And the funding is still at 25 million. Um, in the past few years, there has always been some sort of effort to consolidate all of the funding from all the subject areas to either 40 or 25 million. So you have a lot of different, um, a lot of different subject areas competing for a very small amount of money. But arts education has still always been standalone. So that, I would say that that's definitely a win. Um, I would also say the, uh, around the white space issue, the, the fact that um, performing arts organizations, which everything from small theaters to large performing arts centers would be affected by this, um, these new regulations about uh, the, the, the broadcast spectrum, um, was not even on the radar of the, um, the, the federal agency that was, right? I mean, it was until the coalition came together. And it isn't just, um, theaters, it's also churches, mm -hmm. sports yeah. arenas. Mm -hmm. So the coalition around the um, um, wireless microphone has crossed sectors mm -hmm. also, which mm -hmm. I think is a victory as well. Right. Right. Uh, can I point out, in case uh, as a board member, she's like the, the treasurer? Secretary. Secretary for the PAA. So also just mm -hmm. a lot of information here. Yeah. 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 yeah, I, I also just wanted to say that, you know, tracking all of this is, 
takes a tremendous amount of time. Mm -hmm. And by being in coalition with other national organizations, um, there are people doing this work for us, mm -hmm. tracking the legislation, um, letting us know when we need to act on issues. Um, because there's no way that independently we could be active in this way at the federal level. Um, so. Select net is a dues paying member of PAA. I don't know what I'm <coughs> Because y'all are doing the research, uh, New Americans for the Arts, um, it, it pays us to trust you a lot. Um, but at the same time, to keep our ears to the ground and, and offer advice if we have things that come up. But overall, these are really trustworthy people. They're doing the work for us. And so, yeah. Because <laughs> none of us have time to do the work that you guys do. It's a lot. Like it's all about coalition and partnerships. I think we've all found that to be true for everything, but yes. it's all about coalition and partnerships. There are some members, like for example, uh, TCG takes the lead. Uh, their government affairs person takes the lead on the net neutrality issue, um, and. Uh, what is it, the uh, League of American Orchestras, their person takes the lead on arts education. So we all, within our coalition, have someone who takes the lead and then we come together to work collectively. Just one other thought, I mean, since you all are in the room with the sausage machine, the stuff that makes the legislation is like making the sausage. We all have ideals of how we want things to work. You have to deal with the nitty gritty of what's possible within those things. And so that's something, that's just a note for ourselves you're actually having to deal with intense detail when we say, well, how come there can't be more money for the arts? You know, um, But when it comes down to you know how those allocations are made and who's doing what um, on the Hill, um, you know, a victory was the, the, the House, zero NEA several times in the last several years. And it took a lot of work from this agency to turn into the arts, a lot of citizens to get them to turn the Senate included it and went to conference, and it took a lot of bugging people. And so the, the flip side of that is when these guys send out an email and say, bug your congressman, do it, because it makes a difference. And essentially, citizens saved the National Endowment for the Arts a couple times in the last three or four years when they got zero. So, thank you. But a, a note about this letter. So uh, people raise their hands about saying they get emails from Performing Arts Alliance. Um, we do uh, a couple of different communications. We have advocacy uh, reports, which is sort of a monthly summary of what's going on. Um, we do advocacy updates. So if, for example, um, when the Senate came out with its version of the, uh, its education bill, we have an update and a summary. But also we do action alerts. So uh, you'll get an alert where we're tracking how action is going. There's going to be a vote or there's going to be an opportunity for public comment. You know, we will send out an email with background information, but also a letter that um, has some standard language, just giving a general overview of why an issue is important to the arts. And then also opportunity for you, the recipient, to write a personal message to your legislator that says, I'm in your district, we do this work, uh, a charitable donation helped fund XYZ, and then you send that. And those letters are counted. Your Congress people, you know, your, their staff members do count the letters that are sent in on particular issues. They keep detailed <coughs> notes of meetings when you go and you meet with your legislator. And at the end of the week, there is sort of a summary of everything that happened that the member of Congress gets. So when you go, they are actually paying attention. You might get a staffer, you might get uh, a run down the hallway with somebody in between meetings, but any opportunity you have to make an impression, whether it's sending a letter from an alert, um, you can even just go and find your congressperson's email address from our site. You don't have to have be sending a letter or going to have a meeting makes an impact. I think I saw a hand up here. It's another elbow. Is there, in, in that, is there a differential impact if we were to email, send an email, or actually like write a snail mail letter to make a difference? Snail mail might not make it. Um. <laughs> it used to be that there was like, you could send an email, the snail mail is going to get more attention. But yeah, it, gets, it, it might not make it, but the email system. The visits make a big impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go to Washington because every congressman has an office in your district. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a staffer, but don't think, oh, that doesn't count. It does count. Mm -hmm. So 
go to your local office every time stuff comes up. That really makes a difference. Right. The staffer is the ears of the congressperson. They hear and they share that information. A few years ago, Jerry and I did a, a visit to Capitol Hill to Congress together, and I highly recommend it. Uh, they organize it, TCG organizes it. It's you know, like you just show up and they, 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 they make the appointments for you, they teach you what to talk about, and you go, and it is, um, it, I really recommend it. it it's amazing, it, it's kind of, you feel like you're participating in your government, and it's, it's really awesome. <laughs> On that visit, we visited my congressman, Lou Barletta, who is perhaps one of the nastiest anti-immigration Tea Party Republicans that got elected and he's still in office. Mm -hmm. But we went and we told him about the work we do in his district. We told him, I, I told him about the schools in Hazleton, he's the mayor of Hazleton, that BT has performed in all of, all this stuff. He changed his vote and has been supporting the NEA ever since. Wow. <laughs> um, but not because we were, we, we, you were there and Teresa was there and it was like, um, part of it uh, was just that knowledge of the district and the knowledge of his hometown and, and that this is making a difference and, and your voting for this means that this institution can stay in business and come serve kids in your district. May, and and he, he hasn't gone back. It's one of two issues he's bolted the Tea Party on. That and, and flood relief. <laughs> I it still would vote for him, but <laughs> <laughs> don't tell him that. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> Today. <laughs> so what we wanted to do, I guess this is exchange part, yeah. is um, have a chance for you to think about the issues as they are presented in, um, there's some papers that are around. Um, at each station, there is a different uh, topic from that short list here. And there is what is called our issue brief. Um, the issue brief, if you've been to Arts Advocacy Day, it is um, a list of talking points with a summary and some background and some talking points about why an issue matters. Um, we want to know if the way we talk about issues is reflective of the issue to you. Is it, is it far out field? Do you feel yourself represented in it? What else needs to be said? Um, again, it's, if we are to be representatives of the field, then the field needs to be reflected in the way we talk about issues to your Congress people, or the way we talk about issues when we're strategizing. And if, it, if you think it needs red ink, I think there's a red marker. Um, <laughs> and we've got some areas up to take notes. Um, so the goal is just to really look at the issue and say, what is this? Does this matter to me? Are they, am I reflected in the way people are talking about this issue on a national level? What is missing? What else should we be talking about? And have that conversation and you know, give us some feedback on these sheets of paper that are here. So we get some, some breakouts. I, I just Hi. want to say a word about charitable giving, especially if you're a small organization. You, you may think, oh, I don't have a lot of donors, or the donors who give to me aren't really concerned about tax deduction. But remember, it affects people who give to foundations. And I'm sure a lot of you get grants from the foundation, so it may not matter to the donors you're in direct contact with, but the foundations who support you, that really matters to them a lot. So that is an issue to pay attention to and be attentive to, even though you can't, you're one step removed from that line of thinking with your donor. So. Um, I'm Jerry Lewis, I'm the Not to go to well, you don't want to make a compromise. Is, is there a line that we draw that we don't want to compromise beyond? I'm going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> so we will maybe we don't know. Um, our status, and therefore maybe it may look like a compromise, but it will affect more people negatively than positively. I guess I'm not sure what you mean when you say a compromise. Um, it's, I almost not ask, it's including um, the, the, the neutrality. And our com our, we didn't want to compromise the, the fact that they need to make it a Title three or Title six or something. Um, they, we, we need to make it that, and they will not compromise for that. 
rather than say that you know we we will wait and see, which is where Congress is right now, wait and see and wait until something is broken. And then, you know, by that time they will have implemented policies from for Verizon and AT and Cable Vision and will have been part of this change that. So the, the compromise I'm talking about is that the uh, larger corporations pushing us back and we think we're getting something but we actually need to know. So you're, so you're asking is there a line that we would not cross? A line that we will not cross so we, we, we need to go to the government. I still have to say I'm not sure. Um, that I, I, specific to, I mean each of these areas would have different. Yeah, yeah. Right, that's right. That's what I'm saying. I'm I don't think we've been confronted. It, it, it just doesn't come up that um, simply. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it's really yeah. just so much back and forth. And I mean, th certainly the it, you know, on the net neutrality, fighting the corporate uh, media who want to control it um, has been a line that we have not crossed. Right. Okay. But if, if you don't discuss it, you may get some or you may get hit really hard because you're not even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And there could be doing mm -hmm. more. Yeah. So I found out that when we advocate about the issues that we need to be aware of the, those areas that we, we wish not to compromise on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I was informed that we have 58 minutes. Mm -hmm. Speed round of brainstorming. <laughs> so I'm going to go around the room and tell you where the stations are. We have back here. Thank you. <laughs> That's our cultural exchange group. There is a packet um, summarizing the issue on the chair. And we've got some markers. So we can, someone who from that group can be the writer and sort of the one who tracks through the document. We have cultural exchange over there. Right back here on the door, we've got white space. That's our uh, uh, wireless microphone policy issue. Right back here in the door. Right over here on the wall, we have charitable giving and tax um, IRA rollover right there. Up here, we're going to move back here. On the landing back here, we've got arts education. Upstairs, and <laughs> we're going all over the place. We've got NEA. On the other side, we've got visa processing. And I guess we will go to the doorway, because that's what's left for net neutrality. And I'll be standing over there being no taker person. So again, we've got cultural exchange. Anybody who wants to go talk, debate, read about cultural exchange back there. We've got white space and technology back here. We've got charitable giving over here. Arts education, NEA, visa, and then I'll take net neutrality. And if you go right upstairs, do remember, don't oh, lean oh, on the rail. Oh, <laughs> Is, is, uh, isn't there a connection, strong connection between the visas and the cultural exchange? Yes. So, how do we divide ourselves? Um, yes. You can divide yourself, okay, let's see. Cultural exchange, I guess we can come together if we need to. Could they come but together? in cultural exchange, in the, um, the way that we talk about it as a appropriation for the program and the State Department, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily um, how artists who are being funded for exchanges receive visas. So we, they are they are connected, but the way that we talk about the two issues, we don't um, leave them together. Okay. Thank you. So yes, combine? Um, no? no, let's leave them separate. So we've got, at each station, we've got markers. So if someone from the group wants to select the writer of the thoughts, and we have a, um, a summary. I know, you just got a bunch of other
for net neutrality. I'm glad you're here, of course, making everybody famous, keeping us. Actually, I sent it out to my entire board and company and was like, this is the way you can stay connected.
We actually have we saw it. How would you talk about this? Like like this one
wrap up? Can we just wrap up and we get back together again? Yes, we'll back together. Okay, great. Should I come back into the groups now? Is about what, what's actually going on there. Yeah. And no access to that. 
that yeah, they yeah. job. <laughs> we have two people. Scooter, net neutrality. Net neutrality. Want to give a? We learned about net neutrality. <laughs> <laughs> we had a quick overview oh, session. <laughs> we had a quick overview session. Um, I think I have 60 seconds. I'm just going to ask for the big. What else? Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was amazing. These are complicated issues, and you really are spelling some things out, even though there's yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are some extra handouts of each issue if you want to collect and get that debt overview of every issue. Um, I'm around. Come find I, me. I'll give you I assume all those fact sheets are just up on your website. They are, yeah, they are up on the website. Yeah, so you can download them, and we keep uh, recent activity of, 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 of current events up there as well. So thank you guys so much. Yes. Should I do uh, uh, two?